there was a call, a wit call from the success community and someone had brought up this thing called imposter syndrome. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let me look that up. And as soon as I read the definition, I was like, yep, that's me. This is it. That is Amy Oplinger Singh, a senior Salesforce consultant with the Kerval Group. I'm Josh Burke, a developer evangelist with Salesforce. And here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down with Amy and talk about a topic that is widespread within the technical community, imposter syndrome. We'll talk about what it is, how you can identify it, what you can do about it. And to start, we'll talk about Amy bringing that knowledge to the stage. But I don't think that it was until I actually delivered this presentation for the first time that it kind of set into me that I wasn't alone. I I still felt like even (laughs) when I thought of giving this as a session, Uh I thought nobody's going to come to this. Nobody wants to hear this. It's only (laughs) me. I mean, I was literally the poster child for what I was talking about. Right. So it was, I'm getting goosebumps now, just thinking back to that first time I presented it in at Midwest Dreamin', and yeah. that session was still like the most magical to me, the things that happened there and the conversations that have happened because of that. Right. But yeah, knowing that the room was packed and everybody in the room felt exactly the same way, and it's been now three, four years that I've been giving this, and it's still very right. impactful. So it, it, it is interesting that before you got to that point, you're almost having imposter syndrome about imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I'm in Ohio and you came and talked at, at our group mm-hmm. and that was like at the beginning of my career. Huh. And, you know, Ohana is not real, wasn't a big thing here. Mm -hmm. in this area. So now that I've broadened my horizons and and gotten out there and gotten in the, in the ecosystem more, you know, it's nice to have that support and then connecting with everyone over this is, has been very fulfilling. Okay. So let's take a step back Mm -hmm. and precisely define what is imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is that feeling of inadequacy that you have, even when you have evidence of your success, Mm -hmm. Um, you have the chronic self-doubt and the feelings like you're a fraud and that you shouldn't be there. You know, to a certain extent at this point, I still feel like I am successful because I got lucky. I sort of struggle with my accomplishments. And I think that's a common denominator for a lot of people in the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but with imposter syndrome, it's especially, you know, you you just have the job you have because you got lucky or you're in the right place at the right time. Anybody can do what I do, that sort of thing. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, in any moment you're going to be, someone's going to barge into your office and say, get out, you're a fraud. And you know, that's going to be the end of your ride. So <laughs> this is like the underlying feeling with imposter syndrome. Are there things that people like might be doing in their day to day that might be an indication that they're, they're kind of thinking this way? Um, I think that with the fact that 70% of people, especially in tech feel this way, it's pretty more common than what you think. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I feel like the conversations I've had have, have led me to the conclusion that it's because of the, the varied backgrounds that we all have. Salesforce has a very, a very, um, easy entry really, um, for, if you're motivated to learn it, you can. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, tech moves so fast. You think, uh, especially for me and conversations I've had with others, they feel the same way. If you're, if I'm in a room with, you know, somebody that has computer science degree or, you know, as technical architect, I feel like I don't, I'm not good enough to be here. Mm-hmm. My, you know, never mind the fact that maybe because of my admin skills, I know something <laughs> that they don't know, but right. that's the still the underlying feeling. So I think that it's just the fast nature of tech. We all get overwhelmed. The Salesforce platform is humongous. And yeah. please steer away from anybody that tells you that they're an expert because none of us are. 
And if, <laughs> if someone tells you that they're an expert, I mean, call them out. There's so many nuances and so many different ways to, to, to do things. None of us are experts. And I think that kind of contributes to the, to this feeling like, well, I knew it last month, but they had a release and now everything's different. So now here right. I am back on the bottom. So it's, it's, it's like a constant keeping your head above water, I think. Yeah. So, so, you know, I can relate to that in a couple of ways. One is that, well, one of the constant themes on the podcast has been, you know, how did you get into technology? And there's two, generally two buckets. And one is, are the people who had like liberal arts degrees, but they grew up around like the dot com days. And so they just kind of got into web development. And then you've got like our, your, your hardcore, you know, computer science people. And it's like, I come from that first shop like I, I have an English psychology degree like I was I was going to go writing the great American novel and I ended up doing this stuff basically because I was having late night arguments with one of my English professors about like HTML versus hypercard and if that's not dating me that we were actually talking about hypercard <laughs> at the time I don't, I don't know what would and so you know getting into more and more technical arenas it was very weird for me to actually it because a lot of my, my a lot of my work was as a consultant and so 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 I was like, oh, right. I am the expert. Like, like really? Right. Like, like that, that, like there was this kind of constant disconnect with me, almost like, why are these people asking me these questions and, 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 and expecting these kind of answers? And then it's, it's also kind of interesting to me because of that diversity of the ecosystem. And so it like, like, do you feel like there's a lot of people out there who kind of feel like, well, I must not be doing this right because I'm not a technical person. And I'm going to, I'm, I, I have to say this is a podcast. So I am putting technical in air quotes there. Yeah. So it's interesting that you bring that up because we had this conversation when I first delivered this session at Midwest Treatment. And my friend, Stuart Edeo, he brought up that a manager told him he wasn't technical enough for the job. Mm. And that stuck with him. This is something oh, wow. that a lot of us face, yeah. especially if we don't have that developer background. Oh, you're not technical enough. You don't know this. You don't have any input in this. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, well, you have a org full of code that doesn't need to be code, <laughs> but okay, then right. go with your technical solution. And I'm just an idiot. But, yeah. um, you know, that reinforces your feeling. Someone's mm -hmm. telling you you're not technical enough and you think you you're right. I'm not, I'm not. So this like surfaces this imposter syndrome all over again. And, you know, I think it was, I think it was Zane Turner that posted on Twitter a few, a few months ago. I saw her that somebody, she was at a conference and they were having a conversation and oh yeah, they didn't, they asked for somebody technical and she was literally standing there conversing right. with them. And she thought, yeah, women can also be technical. So um, it's right. just like these little perceptions, these little things that the kind of when you're already feeling like a fraud mm -hmm. can just kind of knock you back down. If yeah. you're not careful. And that's, it is, that's, that's kind of chilling almost that that one point of feedback, like clearly stuck with him. Yeah. Right. Like it kind of it kind of haunted him moving forward. And and yeah, it chills me a little bit that anybody would be brave enough to stand in front of Zane Turner and ask if there's anybody technical that they could talk right. to. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm now recalling I, during the uh, the dot com bust, I was doing a bunch of interviews and I went to one and it's like I know I it's like I know I nailed the interview. Mm -hmm. Like they asked me all of these super technical questions and I answered every single one. And then their response to me was, Well, you're not enterprise enough. <laughs> and, and so I feel like what there's also what does that even mean? <laughs> right. And so I feel like there's maybe this constant shorthand from the other side of the room, which is like, it's not that you're not technical enough. It's just that they don't actually have any proper feedback to give you. So this is just an easy, you know, easy way to be dismissive effectively. Right. You make decisions too quickly, Josh. That's why you're not enterprise too much. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Yeah. That's really fascinating. So if people start, you know, feeling these things on the day to day, are there some, some specific coping mechanisms that they can use to kind of overcome them? Yes. A hundred percent. So first and foremost, I think putting a name on it, that's what helped me the most. And this mm -hmm. is the aha moment that I see in a lot of conversations that I have around this is like, 
that's exactly how I'm feeling. I didn't know it was a thing. You know, that right. is just very validating in itself. Like, okay, I'm not alone. And then that, you know, that fact about the 70%, I, I'm like, look to your left, look to your right. You know, these people feel the same way you do. And you have a group of people to talk to. So the next piece of advice I give is to share your feelings with these people. Um, mm -hmm. I've never had a conversation with anybody where I, I expressed what I was thinking or where I was feeling. And they said, oh, you're absolutely right, Amy. You're being ridiculous. You shouldn't be here. And they stormed off. You know, right. think about your worst scenario. That's never going to happen. This ecosystem is very welcoming, very supportive. So right. share those feelings with other people um, and then focus on the facts. You know, I often mention I keep a notebook when somebody <laughs> tweets me nice things or sends me a card. I have a big binder of this stuff. When I do something awesome on a project, I write it down because six months from now, when it comes up again, or I'm getting stuck and frustrated with some feature, I can look back on that and say, well, I didn't know it, didn't know that then, but I figured it out and I did it. So this is not going to be any different. So that's yeah. very helpful for me. And then anytime you're, especially like some sort of comment from someone else, challenge that. Gotcha. No one knows your technicality and no one knows your skill set. Just because you're not quote unquote, whatever they define as technical. Right. Doesn't mean you are an idiot and, you know, don't have anything to contribute. So you have a seat at the table for a reason. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. And I just, I feel like, especially in with our, our platform and our system, it's kind of like what you were saying before. Okay. You don't think I'm technical, but you also have a bunch of useless code. So, so where is your, where, where's your definition of technical actually gotten? Right. Right. And I've met, it goes both ways. You know, I've met a lot of developers that don't, that can't find anything in the setup menu for, to save their life. Do you oh, know yeah. what I mean? So it's, it's a different lens. Developers are develop and, and admins admin, but you know, we all work together and no one is more important than the other. No one is, you know, different from the other. We all have different skill sets and we all have something to contribute. And I think that you can't let someone's limited lens define your feelings about yourself. Right. Absolutely. It, or, or define, you know, what's quote unquote right or quote unquote wrong. I still remember yeah. my early days at Model. I went into a business meeting with a, with a business analyst and we were going down all of the things that the customer was going to need. And we got out of the meeting and I'm in the, in the hallway with them. I'm like, well, this, this feature X, you know, it's a little complicated, but I can get it into a, a trigger. It's actually going to take me longer to write the unit task than the actual trigger. But, you know, I just want to point it out that this is this is not trivial work. And he just sort of blinked at me. He's like, or I could put it into a workflow for you and you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, I feel like the day-to-day -day aspect is kind of interesting too, though, because like define for me a little bit of the, the feeling of a fear of failure when it comes to this. So <laughs> I guess all of this, the story that I share the most is like my very first project because I really felt like, oh my God, how did I land this project? And so I took the very brave approach of hiding <laughs> from anybody mm -hmm. and not interacting with anybody for about the first, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks, you know, yeah. I didn't want them to have a conversation with me and say, oh my God, she's an idiot. Why is she here? So I think that that kind of fear of failure lends itself to another kind of problem with imposter syndrome and people that feel this way, even though they're successful, they're perfectionists. Mm -hmm. We're, and that's why we have this imposter syndrome to begin with really is because we want everything to be just right when we put it out there. We don't want to be questioned and, and these sort of things. So you have this perfectionism and this fear of success, this fear, lack of confidence, this fear of failure, all in one kind of mix. And it's just a perfect storm of, you know, crazy. It right. just really drives yourself crazy, for lack of a better term. You know, it's it's all these feelings at the same time. And you can very easily, if you let it go... You can start spinning and it happens to all of us. I'm not saying that I don't feel this. Every time I start a new project, I feel like this, like, yeah. you know, I don't know anything. Why am I on this project? And then 
a month in, I'm like, oh, no one else I'm working with knows anything. I'm the one that knows anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So it, tur- it turns around very quickly for me, but it's always, it's always the same. And it's yeah. been, you know, five years now and it's still like, I have all these tools to deal with it. So it's, it's a much shorter cycle now for me than it used to be, but gotcha. it still, uh, still rears its ugly head. And I, and I'm just attributing that solely to the nature of tech. Got the it. quickness with it, the way it moves, it's just so fast. Yeah. And first of all, I think it's uh, when I've talked to a lot of people in the community, it feels like as a community, we have this really interesting perspective on failure where there's a lot of people who are able to really kind of embrace it. And it's like failure as a learning mechanism, failure as, you know, a means of, you know, learning and moving forward. But on the flip side, I, I think that really, a lot of people usually are talking about that when it comes to approaching like a Salesforce Saturday event or going and getting your certification. And, and this is like a different level of detail, right? Because we're, we're, you're talking about your day to day. You're talking about the, the project that your, you know, your manager is oh. going to do a review of kind of thing. Right. And, and so there's a, there's a distinction of what's, what's on the line there. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, Certification, you know, my personal certification philosophy is I'm going to fail it the first time. Yeah. This is, you know, so <laughs> I've gotten over that. Um, yeah. The first time I failed a cert, my admin cert, I was so devastated and I froze. And again, it underlined all these reasons why I was in the wrong mm-hmm. profession. And I didn't take it again for six months, which is ex- exactly wrong, exactly opposite of the advice that I give people now. Gotcha. I'm like, as soon as you fail, go schedule it two, two weeks from now. Do it again. Just get back on the horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so now my philosophy has changed to, yes, I'm going to fail it the first time. Yeah. And ironically enough, that's relieved some of the stress and I tend to pass more on the first time now. <laughs> so I'm hoping that sticks yeah. with my next exam. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to that day-to-day project thing, one of the things yeah. I used to always tell my teams that I'm wondering if there's a, there's a corollary on your side was like, think of this project as the time to get rid of your old code, because I know we're doing similar things, but that was three months ago. There's been a release. Don't assume that the apex you wrote, you know, last year, six months ago, three months ago is the apex you should be using on this project. Because for all we know, Salesforce just put something out there and reduce your 10 lines down to one. Right. And that, that I think is where a lot of the, um, the anxiety stems Mm -hmm. from. It's like, just because I knew it, like you said, three months ago, doesn't mean there's not a better, quicker, faster way now, which probably there is. Um, so you can't get too attached to a solution that I don't get attached to anything. If the requirements being met and it saves me time, let's do it. I, I don't, I don't care that my process builder was wrong. Tear it up. Let's right. rebuild it. You know, so you can't get too attached or dig your heels in too much saying, nope, this solution or this code that I wrote three months ago is it. I'm not even going to look at it. You, you just have to be more flexible than that. Yeah. So, so let's flip that around a little bit. How would you define mm-hmm. a fear of success? <laughs> so... For me, I can speak for myself, and that was, um, I guess, a fear of if the spotlight's on you, Mm -hmm. there's more people to tear you down or more people to point out your flaws, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. So as, you know, my career trajectory increased, my visibility increased, I started getting more and more panicked. Interesting. why are these people who, why are these people following me on Twitter? Why are they wanting me to speak at their group? Why, you know, right. I started getting a lot of anxiety around that. So again, it goes back to being seen as, you know, the expert or being, you know, somebody that has it all together. And I know in my mind, and I'm the first one to tell you, no, I definitely don't. This was my whole kind of fear in initially even talking about this, yeah, I told no one that I submitted to speak at a Salesforce conference. Oh, wow. This was, I told no one because I thought for sure, I knew for sure I was going to get rejected and I didn't want to be embarrassed. Right. So I told no one. And then strangely enough, it was, it happened and it was well received. And it turns out to be the thing I'm still talking about four years later. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, I'm happy about that. Like this yeah. is like a huge accomplishment for me 
the irony on that is not lost to me. You know, <laughs> I'm talking about how I feel like such an imposter and then everyone's like embracing it and saying, yes, me too, me too, me too. So right. that's very satisfying to me. That, that is an interesting feedback loop because it's a, it's yeah. not just a fear of success, but a fear of visibility to a yeah. certain extent. Um, but on the flip side, you know, like I said, you kind kind of got on the radar for the podcast because multiple people have referred to your talk as this was this was the moment that they had also that moment that oh gosh, seventy percent of the people around me are feeling exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. And it just gives me goosebumps to know that, and it's still you know, complete strangers still email me. Um, I just heard your your dream forest thing and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I'm you're asking me to be on this podcast because people can now understand that my voice on the Dreamforce recordings doesn't sound like that I have lost. <laughs> Every time I go to San Francisco, the weather does not agree with me, and I don't sound like this. <laughs> and that's not how I normally sound. So. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that it still happens. People still listen to it, still want to know about it, and still, you know, reach out to me. And it's, it's very... It, it's the strangest feeling for me. Yeah. It's just something very personal for me and that I was kind of embarrassed about. But it just underlies, you know, my personal feeling that if, especially in this ecosystem, if you are who you are, people can see that and mm-hmm. um, you'll connect with them, which is good. In, and how, like specifically in the workplace itself, how do you feel like this affects not just you, but the people around you? Well... <sighs> For me, like if you're, again, going back to being a perfectionist and things like that. So if Mm -hmm. you're a a lead on a project and you're feeling like you have to work 10, 12 hours a day, your team is seeing that they're thinking, okay, that's what she expects. I need to also do that. This, This is how this, your imposter syndrome, your need to be a perfectionist, your need to do these things or act in these behaviors affects your team. Mm -hmm. You can, I've worked with some people that have expressed to me that they, they feel the same way about imposter center, but they're like more on the negative side where it kind of stops them from being able to make any decisions. Mm -hmm. So that also affects your team because we're picking up the work Mm -hmm. that you just are frozen now. So, you know, there's lack of confidence in that team member and things like that. So all of these things really can affect your work in a negative way. Yeah. So obviously talking about it and acknowledging that there's, you know, people out there that are suffering from this as well is important. But what are some other, you know, resources and places that people can go to to learn more about it and learn more about coping with it? Sure. So there are any number of online resources, books, things like that. There's a success a trailblazer community group, imposters only. Okay. That you can join. It's a private group, so no one will, you know, only the people that are in there are in there. And yeah. it's just very open where you can share your feelings. And a lot of people aren't um, maybe comfortable with that and more are comfortable with a one-on-one type relationship. Mm-hmm. You can reach out to me. Anybody can reach out to me at any time. I'm very accessible. I love talking <laughs> to people. Um, so I make friends all around the world because of that. Yeah. Um, so don't feel like you have to suffer in silence or someone's going to laugh at you or anything. This is not the case. This is, you ask anybody in the ecosystem about imposter syndrome, I can guarantee you they've probably heard of it, they feel it, and they want to talk to you about it and help you, you know, on your journey through it. It is kind of interesting how it's sort of this this invisible epidemic that everybody knows about. Yeah, but then didn't know about. But then didn't know, exactly. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> You know, it's just like this unidentified feeling. And, you know, just when I think people, oh, my God, everybody already knows about this. They've heard me talk about it. But then in my mind, I have to think there's a whole new crew of people coming through this ecosystem all the time. There's there's always the next generation of Amy coming along. (laughs) God help you all. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Akron. How is the user group doing in this day and age? Well, it's slow. Um, yeah. Ak- I, I was the Cleveland Women in Tech. That was getting too much for me, too far of a drive for me. Got it. So I got a new leader for the um, Cleveland Women in Tech. They're doing great. 
and came down here. The Akron um, admin group started, so I said, oh, perfect. Let me start a WIT group here. Mm-hmm. We'll have some. Um, it's small. It's slow going because yeah. in this area, you know, it's just kind of not crazy Ohana-ish, um, but it's going okay. We're doing some virtual events due here for another virtual event probably within the next month. So, Got it. How did you get involved in with success in the first place? My first dream force that I ever went to 2015, I met, uh, two very special Ohana members, Christy Campbell, Mm -hmm. Toya Tate. And I told them both in separate conversations, Oh, it's great. You have these wit groups in your area, you know, where I live in Ohio, there's nothing like that. And both of them had the exact same answer for me. And they said, (laughs) Uh, start one. Nice. And I thought, oh, well, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> so <laughs> I did. <laughs> Got home from Dreamforce, applied, and there was Cleveland Women in Tech. That's awesome. And I mean, my <laughs> follow up question was, how can more people get involved? But I think you might have just answered that. There you go. Yes. Nice. Get involved in your local user group. If there's not one, start one for yeah. sure. Uh, and if that's too much for you, there are plenty of online resources and ways for you to get involved. There was a quick document that I started a few months ago when the pandemic started that lists all of the, where people can go in and list all of their virtual meetings. Oh, cool. So you can a- attend a meeting anywhere around the world. And that's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask Amy about her favorite non-technical hobby, which turned out to be Indian cooking, something that she got into from something that I can actually really relate to, because thanks to chronic allergies, I can't smell anything either. I got into that by um, being involved in different Indian initiatives over Mm -hmm. the last few years, getting friends over there, visiting, tasting the food, and I can't. I don't have a sense of smell. I lost my sense of smell many years ago. Oh. So food is very muted for me. Mm -hmm. And I first had Indian food in 2015, and I thought that the whole sky and heavens opened up. (laughs) Yes. And the magical moment that was occurring on my taste buds was just a fluke, but it was not. My thanks to Amy for the great conversation about imposter syndrome, and of course, my thanks to you for listening. If you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. I'll talk to you next week. 